What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest 239 at block height 650,276, Sunday, uh, September 27th. So what is up today, Janine? Well, I have uh, not been very active on social media the past three weeks because I've been busy, and I decided as my um, break from social media hiatus tweet to just share a result that i got when i was looking through uh bitcoin and cryptocurrency websites in blacklight which is a new tool that the markup has released to basically allow you to check what kinds of ad trackers and cookies and canvas fingerprinting and other things you may be connecting to when you go to these websites um, and so I shared the result for Zcash Foundation, and, well, the response was quite interesting. As usual, Sarah Jamie Lewis is, uh, basically they don't deserve her, and she was the only one who seemed to give a shit and also not shit on me in the process. So, um, yes, I, <laughs> it has been an interesting few hours. Yeah, it's just every single thing that that group does in response to getting called out on something is just so cringe. I also, I find it quite interesting because when I was going through websites, I even checked my own newsletter page and hey, imagine that. No trackers, no canvas fingerprinting, no nothing. Um I mean, part of that is, you know, it's being hosted by GitHub, obviously, but yeah, pretty good, like no no issues. And yet um, I now have responses in my mentions about how it's really hard to do a newsletter without um, tracking. I agree, it's, it is kind of hard to do the easy route of using mail subscription and marketing services like MailChimp and all of them who don't really like Bitcoin very much and may censor your content. And that is explicitly why I chose to not do that and run my own subscription list. Um, but I can completely understand that after spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on lawyers to fight over copyright issues between the two uh, Zcash multisig uh, as they're called companies or foundations that they may not have any money left to not have trackers in their email subscription feed. Yeah, I mean, it's not like a single person managed to accomplish that, you know, in their own time. Imagine what a whole team of devs could do. Yeah, or, uh, you know, they could, they're already ho apparently hosting the uh, code for the website on GitHub, so maybe they could do what I did, is just put it there. And you're done. No trackers. It's not as fancy as uh, MailChimp and all the other ones, but hey, privacy is more important, isn't it? Well, I think so for a privacy coin. Yeah. So speaking of silly, uh, I got in the face shit. I guess uh, 
you know, before we get into the actual stories for the day, I thought we could uh, bring up some of the, the cherry points from the, uh, the FinCEN leaks. Uh, well, yes, you can do some. Uh, unfortunately, that is not something that I've been able to focus on, but from just the initial uh, blog post or slash article that the ICIJ put up about it, there seems to be a number of quite interesting people in there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's especially the just the things. Um so like HSBC um, just continued facilitating the laundering of millions of dollars for a Ponzi scheme um, out of Hong Kong, even after they definitively learned it was a Ponzi scheme from U.S. investigators. Hmm. Or that time that J.P. Morgan um, let a company funnel a billion dollars through a London account with no clue who owned it, and it wound up being money from a mobster on the FBI's top 10 wanted list. Or um, an associate of Vladimir Putin using Barclays um, as a way to get around sanctions, preventing him from using financial services in, in, in the West. Um, or how about somebody donating millions of pounds um, to a, a political party in the UK um, whose husband was funded by Russian oligarchs? Um, <laughs> like the, the UK is where most of these um, leaked documents actually came from. And it's pretty much ranked up there with Cyprus in terms of the high risk of the... Uh, <laughs> the uh money laundering nonsense and uh yeah then you also have all the deutsche bank stuff and uh the united arab emirates central bank refused to do anything um to stop iranian dark money from flowing around so uh yeah it's just like these guys just do literally whatever the fuck they want even when the governments know it's going on and proactively told them. Um, and because of how SARS work, um, that's kind of a shield from prosecution for a lot of this. <laughs> yep. And once again, these are people who, like, we know, like, they're known to be a risk. Uh, in many cases, they even know what the money is being used for and where it's going, and they don't stop them because none of this stuff in the global financial surveillance system is meant to actually stop people who are powerful enough to uh, do anything that actually hurts people. It's meant to just suppress everyone else and make it more difficult for the average person. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't do anything for intelligence agencies, banks, you name it, whoever has power is able to get around this stuff. And I mean, just in case it wasn't clear enough, um, I agree with what Sarah Jamie Lewis said uh, the same day that they were published, which is that the underlying proposition of the initial batch of FinCEN files uh, stories that global mass uh, global uh, bleh, global financial surveillance and a distinctly U.S. centric morality should be used um, proactively and globally to censor and block transactions without judicial oversight is a deeply disturbing one. So. I wouldn't say that in general, I actually agree with kind of the narrative that this um, release is being used for, which is we need more financial surveillance. The lesson we should learn from it is that despite the extensive financial surveillance that is ongoing and is supposedly implemented, the organizations who are drafting these policies, writing these policies, trying to enforce these policies themselves have... Uh, at least some of them have admitted that this stuff is not working. Um, but they're going to keep doing it anyway. And these people are going to keep getting away with it. I don't see really anything changing very much as a result of this, maybe in a few countries who actually want to shape up. But at the end of the day, this just makes obvious that the financial surveillance doesn't solve anything because it's about power. It's not about stopping crime. Mm -hmm. as long as you know the guy in the camera room um 
You know, it doesn't matter that you get caught on camera. Yeah, it's just like, I'm kind of just, you know, I don't know, like, what's the reaction going to be? Because it's, I really don't see any big uproar outside of people who are already aware of these things and furious about it. Like, I have yet to see some big kind of normie, like, reaction of offense to any of it. Yeah, I mean, the data set is still interesting because, like I said, um, <laughs> the the other lesson that we should learn from this is that supposedly private reports and financial data that these organizations are supposed to be protecting, um, guess what? They're not protected. So all of that thing about how you can have your financial surveillance cake and eat the financial surveillance confidentiality too, well, no. Mm-hmm. Well, more fucked up illustrations of how those above us can do what they want, and we have to listen to their arbitrary rules. I have to say, like, because um, given that this was another ICIJ publication, the same one that did the um, Panama Papers, there was a really interesting conversation that I had with um, Bustin Obermeyer, the guy who... Um, was originally contacted by the source for the Panama Papers. And we were just having a discussion about, you know, financial surveillance and stuff and what journalists could do to protect themselves against powerful people, which may involve using some of the tools that powerful people use um, <laughs> to hide criminal activity. And at one point, I he said something along the lines of that he doesn't think that, I, I don't remember if he said anonymous or private, but I think he said, uh, I don't, he he basically didn't believe in anonymous or private money and i said um so you want a cashless society and he kind of stopped and he was like oh i didn't think of that like <laughs> like so that's that's kind of the people that you're dealing with they are they're so they are so focused on the documents and what they show and obviously this can make a lot of people angry and think that, oh, we need more financial surveillance. But then at the end of the day, they don't realize that the systems that are integral to, you know, the privacy of the everyday person, which is worth protecting, can be impacted by that. And saying that money should never be anonymous or private means that you are against cash and i think a lot of these people are not actually against cash in practice and they don't realize that that is the implication of what they're saying mm -hmm. and you know as, as somebody who has a little story with a credit card processor um let's just say when things pop up with like a flag of suspicious transaction um which which it does uh i have never been able to come up with a single rational reason or explanation why that happens it just happens every once in a while when somebody pays with a card and normal people are just gonna have to deal with disruptions if that passes a threshold they don't get the uh, get out of jail free card all righty though uh guess we want to just get to it mm-hmm so uh, Yus Jaeger, um, I think a week or two ago now, um, probably more like a week at this point. Um, yeah, I have not been tracking days well this week. Um, announced that he was leaving uh, Lightning Labs. And part of the reason he's doing this is because uh, pretty much he wants to concentrate on solving um, the HTLC issue. In, in the sense that uh, having way too many HTLCs open on a channel just opens up way too many denial of service attack vectors, um, even potential attacks like the flood and loot attack that we've covered on the show that could result in actually having money stolen. Um, and it just derives you know, from the fact that the on-chain transactions for a channel with too many HTLCs involved are massive, expensive, and um, you know a transaction can only be so big. So one of the first things he's doing to alleviate this issue is a project called Circuit Breaker, and pretty much it's just a uh, overlay 
that intercepts and handles um, HTLC forwarding. And it allows you to pretty much on a peer by peer basis um, decide how many HTLCs you'll allow to be in flight at any given time um, per peer that you're connected with. And so the idea is that, uh, you know, a default, um, which he has set at five right now, um, would be the max amount of pending HTLCs if you use this. And you can individually adjust this for each node that you're connected with. So let's say, uh, you know, somebody connects to you, you don't know them, um, you can just leave it at five as the maximum outstanding HTLCs. But if you're connected to a, a known reliable entity that you trust, you know, you could crank that up to 100 or take it all the way to the 483 max. But the idea is pretty much just instead of globally limiting things um, for all channels, um, this allows you to kind of fine grain um, how you want to deal with uh, every node that you open channels to. Um, and he kind of likens it to, I think this is a good analogy, kind of like a firewall um, for lightning um, as to how a firewall functions for the internet in general. And so like, I think this is a, a pretty good place to start with this issue because really globally limiting things is a massive consequence for the overall lightning network. Whereas really these kinds of issues come down to you know, the single trust dynamic or inter or interconnection between two individual modes. And so I think this is a huge step to kind of granularize um, that type of throughput throttling rather than just apply global limits. So uh, hopefully, um, you know, people tinker with this and smooth it out and actually get this out there as a, a baseline feature in LND rather than just a piece of uh, alpha software right now. But uh, yeah. Slight little improvement in terms of uh, lightning optimization to defend against a uh, class of attacks. Boom. Boom indeed. And uh, I guess next up, um, Tom Trevithan from Commerce Block actually just recently posted to the Bitcoin mailing list um, a proposal for doing coin swaps on state chains. And pretty much this would be building on their uh, Mercury state chain implementation that uh, pretty much uses a multi-party ECDSA protocol to transfer control between two different users and decrementing time locks um, to actually enforce the, the proper state. So there's kind of that limit on how many times you can update it. But they've put together a, uh, a protocol effectively where say four people who want to coin swap can come together with the state chain entity and set up um, kind of an all-in-one swap where the entire pool atomically sets up a transfer, initiates the transfer, and then completes it with the state chain entity. And because interactions with the state chain entity are blinded and scrambled, they can't really figure out who has um, the new ownership of the coin. So rather than something like uh, doing it on chain like Belcher's proposal, um, where you actually have to move into a new address and then out um, in a second transaction. This would all just be an instant um, atomic off-chain coin swap that would just happen in a pool. But um, an issue they've found with this is that the, the way the multi-party ECDSA protocol works, um, it's kind of a two-step where the current owners of the UTXO initiate the transfer um, coordinating with the state chain entity and then the receiver has to actually complete an interaction to affect like the full transfer of control where they have a valid key shard now and the problem with that is because it's an interactive protocol if a round fails out um, in terms of somebody's refusing to complete that uh, interactive protocol, 
there's not really a way um, to prove whether it was a current owner sending it or the receiver who disrupted the protocol um, to assign blame and then ban that entity from the coin swap. And their current thinking is using a, a zero knowledge proof um, so that the sender can prove that they acted properly in the protocol and then prove to the state chain entity that the receiver was the one who disrupted it. But they're kind of worried about um, you know, how heavy that is computationally on clients during mixing. And so they kind of put this idea out on the mailing list um, and they're looking for thoughts or inputs in terms of what other ways besides a zero knowledge proof that you could figure out whether the sender or the receiver is to be blamed. But, um, you know, even that kind of issue, I think this would be a very interesting tool and especially like there's nothing stopping you from hosting HTLCs or other things on top of a state chain. Something like this could actually interact with a vanilla implementation like Belcher's. So, you know, hopefully um, somebody out there can come up with something a little lighter than a, a ZK proof. But um, yeah, I think this is a pretty neat thing that kind of flew under the radar. Mm-hmm. I'm like scrambling to <laughs> work on my newsletter this month because I haven't been working on it on a regular basis as much. So I am trying to keep up with things now. Kind of wishing there was a privacy newsletter to help me with that. <laughs> I'll, I'll be sure to ping you with anything uh, important I see. Alrighty though. Uh, Stupid government time. Ah, uh, yes, the Coinbase lawyer. Mr. Comptroller is at it ruling Mr. comptroller -y things again. So, um, this is really kind of interesting because the quick little blurb, um, that went along with the letter and a lot of the, uh, mentions and discussions around this I've seen are mostly related to the fact that the comptroller just cleared um, national and federal banks to host reserves for stable coins. But it is a little more nuanced and interesting than that. Um, so they have um, done that in a very narrow context. But that narrow context is pretty much in the case of a stable coin using a hosted wallet. And so under their definitions, um, that's pretty much just a custodial account. Although they do leave room for, um, you know, things where a, a account holder actually does have a crypto or cryptographic key and there is some kind of cryptography involved. Um, you know, their definition allows for that, but still is generally just a custodial account. Um, and they explicitly clarify that this letter does not address or make any conclusions in regards to stable coins that allow the use of unhosted wallets. So that is um, a very clear distinction and an important point. But in the case of such hosted wallet stable coins, um, they have cleared U.S. banks to engage in um, deposit taking and reserve holding um, for stable coin issuers. And they, one, specifically point out the fact that um, unless accounts are structured properly at the bank, that there is no FDIC insurance for, say, $100 million just sitting in a single account. So they explicitly point that out as a major risk and something to um, consider on the bank's part when engaging with stablecoin issuers. Um, but more importantly, they also explicitly clarify the need for the bank to fulfill all um, Bank Secrecy Act um, requirements, all Patriot Act requirements, all KYC, AML, um, due diligence requirements. 
Um, and even go so far as to suggest that banks should regularly interact with stablecoin issuers who are their customers to guarantee that the reserves that are held on that customer's behalf um, actually support the entire issuance of a, uh, a stable coin circulating and that banks should have some way to actively um, manage and monitor um, whatever their their customers are issuing in those terms and uh, they kind of compare this to prepaid bank card programs and the requirements banks have for being involved with or custodying for those um so yeah you know when i first saw this headline my thought was um ooh, this is going to get interesting um but i don't think it will because they pretty much explicitly clarified that any kind of stable coin you can use with a independent um, wallet directly interacting with whatever chain that it's hosted on um, without any kind of controls um, is not covered under anything mentioned in this letter. And they are specifically speaking of hosted wallets. So that's a purely custodial setup or at best case, um, or best case, something like um, Tether issued on Liquid using Blockstream security setup, where everything would be hosted in a two of two key set that the issuer had to sign off on for any movement to occur. Um, that is probably the furthest I could see um, like anything in this letter applying to. So... Um, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, this is them probably being hesitant to proactively move against stable coins or declare anything a no-no um, that users can interact with like that. But I clearly see no other direction they can go in from there um, with how they explicitly laid out that distinction in this letter before clarifying that banks are allowed to engage in these activities. So that is going to have some interesting consequences for stable coins in this space and just the market in this space in general. Because um, you know, even though all of them do have the ability to freeze ultimately um, things occurring on the the networks these are hosted on, um, you know, there is still some degree of being able to use that independently um, with proper obfuscation or, or handling of that. Whereas what this letter is laying out is um, not even allowing the room for that. We. Yep. I think, uh, I think very icky feeling um, fiat digital wallets are in a lot of our futures. Not for me. Hopefully. Surveillance coin. Mm hmm But I do believe there are some more icky things governments are doing ahead. Yeah, so this is a story that I have pushed off twice, which I usually don't do, but I don't read Ukrainian, and so I put off actually trying to translate it to verify that it was actually saying what was being said that it was saying and i finally done that and it actually goes well with another story that is very similar um but basically earlier this month russian hodl on twitter pointed out that there was a bill proposed um by some committees in the ukrainian government i think the supreme council of ukraine or i, I believe it's their parliament um, and it roughly translates to draft law on amendments to the criminal procedure code of Ukraine to improve the effectiveness of the fight against cybercrime and the use of electronic evidence. And according to Russian HODL, the bill includes a part that will authorize the, quote, cyber police to confiscate um, people's Bitcoin. And so I was kind of trying to just translate and read some of what it said. And there's an explanatory note which reads... Uh, again, translating to English, this bill was developed by a working group formed uh, in December, December, I think 11th, 2019, at the Committee on Law Enforcement to improve the efficiency of pretrial investigation of cybercrime and the use of electronic evidence. 
And there's a part referring to virtual currency that um, translates as it's like point number two. And it says regulation of the procedure on special confiscation of virtual assets. Um, at present, special confiscation does not cover virtual assets, although legalization, um, this part's a bit unclear because it translated to legalization and then in parentheses laundering. Um, oh, I see. Yes, laundering to make it look legal. Um, of proceeds from crime is legalized mainly through unregulated virtual markets, according to research by the International Monetary Fund. Worldwide unregulated virtual markets provide the opportunity to launder money ranging from um, 2.17 to 3.61 trillion U.S. dollars annually. An example of an uncontrolled virtual market is Silk Road, which had a turnover of 1.2 billion dollars. And so I wasn't really sure what special confiscation meant. So I actually looked up um, some like Ukrainian law articles on what that is. And so I'm going to read from parts one second while I scroll. Do, 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 do. All right. So um, the article says provisions on special, I think this was from an article from 2016, um, provisions on special confiscation are introduced in the Code of Criminal Procedure as a separate section, um, peculiarities of forfeiture of money, currency values, Ukraine's government bonds, and Ukraine treasury bills, precious metals, stones, and income from them before passing a sentence. Um, it says, before passing a sentence, enforced collection may be imposed on the property in criminal proceedings for the following crimes cited with reference to articles of the Criminal Code of Ukraine. So basically, the impression I get is that this is like, kind of like civil asset forfeiture, sort of, in a way, like they're, or like when they freeze your bank accounts if you're under investigation. So it says, taking possession, embezzlement, or seizure of property through abuse of office. And I, I think this article actually focused on how how um, special um, confiscation can be abused. Um, but it says, uh, it follows from the above that special confiscation may affect not only the suspects, but also the innocent persons, including bona fide acquirers, those who did not know and could not know about illegal origin of the property. This circumstance is a great corruption risk and provides ample opportunities for abuse by law enforcement agencies and courts. Um, said persons may be subjected to special, special confiscation only if the suspect is hiding from the investigating bodies in court to evade criminal responsibility, is put on a wanted list either at the state, interstate, or international level, and has been on the wanted list for more than six months. The suspect, um, the accused, died and criminal proceedings were closed as a result. Um, or through consent of the state, if there's an extra, uh, if the person is extradited regarding the criminal offense has not been obtained and criminal proceedings were closed. Um, so it looks like, um, also based on the page that Russian HODL links to, that this bill is still in the discussion stage. It has not been passed, um, but I don't read Ukrainian, so I may be wrong. This is just basically me trying to translate a bit of the ex explanation document that came with the bill, which was a lot shorter and easier to um, do that with. But for anyone who does read Ukrainian, the document is attached in the tweet. And also, I think the article that I used to kind of figure out what special confiscation was, so you can read those yourself. So it sounds to me like, at least in the part of this dealing with Bitcoin confiscation, like that leaves room for like say somebody who just got paid for some legitimate thing um with illicit money to not have that confiscated from them if they actually cooperate am i right um yeah i don't see i mean, like i said i didn't read the entire bill because i can't i don't know the language but from the explanation it just sounds like they are now adding um, cryptocurrencies to the list of things that can be subject to special confiscation. So it's not necessarily, I mean, I, that doesn't sound like it's specifically targeting Bitcoin or saying that authorities have a unique ability to seize it, but obviously um, they can use some of the list of 
you know, kind of triggers that can cause special confiscation to happen. And that may be more likely if cryptocurrency is involved and there's this assumption that criminality isn't therefore involved. Um, But as far as I can see, I don't see, it's not like a blanket, you know, they can take this from you just because it's Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency. It's just, it looks like it's been updated to the existing rules for special confiscation that already existed in, in the Ukraine. Okay. Well, it's just, I think, a matter of time before some people wind up in that situation through bad luck and uh, people realize how easy it is for that type of stuff to happen. Yep. But uh, what, what, What's going on with their neighbor to the east? Yeah, so uh, this this is why I chose to kind of put it off and then added it today because there is also a um, bill that is being discussed in Russia. I'm not sure. I mean, basically it's a bill and in fact, it looks like it's doing some of the similar things, but it's not broadly focusing on like, like criminal procedure as much. Well, I mean, it is, it's part of the, anyway. So in other news in languages I can't read, there's an article in rbc.ru, which is a Russian news channel that I believe is a partner of like CNBC and CNN. Um, When I looked at the Wikipedia page, I don't really read Russian news, but it seems like Russia will also be making changes to their criminal procedure rules to cover cryptocurrencies. Um, And this mostly focused on like uh, taxation, not so much like a general... Uh, criminal procedure change but the ministry of finance it says in a well translation of this russian article proposed to tighten the regulation of cryptocurrencies in russia the department has prepared a package of bills that relate to the obligation of citizens to declare transactions with digital money and create um and the creation of cryptocurrency wallets experts warn of the danger of adopting the proposed rules the Ministry of Finance has prepared a new version of the draft law uh, regulating cryptocurrencies available to RBC Crypto, which I b- must it must be like the crypto focused version of RBC, the news organization. But um, they say the amendments concern uh, the criminal uh, procedure codes, the code of administrative offenses, the tax code, and the law on combating legalization laund- uh, in parentheses laundering of incomes. In the explanatory note to the document is proposed to recognize digital currency as property in order to introduce taxation. So the focus is, or the the kind of change that is being made is very similar. They're trying to recognize that Bitcoin is a form of property that, you know, in the Ukraine situation, it's something that can also be seized. Um, In this case, it seems to mostly be focused on taxation and not just did you commit a crime. And so the article also says failure to declare a wallet if more than 1 million uh, rubles have passed through it in a year becomes a criminal offense and can be punished by forced labor or even imprisonment for up to three years. That's not a scary sentence. Um, In addition, the bill proposes to recognize the commission of crimes using cryptocurrency as an aggravating circumstance. That is particularly concerning um, because I, like I said, I I I only read the explanatory notes in the previous one, but it didn't seem like there was anything that was like it wasn't criminalizing having Bitcoin using Bitcoin per se. It was just saying this is also property. This can also be seized like other things under our rules. But if this is true, um, it says the bill proposes to recognize the commission of crimes using cryptocurrencies as an aggravating circumstance. If I'm reading that right, that basically means that... um, using cryptocurrencies is like an extra red flag um regardless of you know the uh, whatever crime you're committing using it i guess um so that so is like not a, a good multiplier sign. like you're gonna get hit harder just because it involved crypto I mean, that's kind of what it sounds like to me. And based on the fact that, because the rest of the article basically has analysis from a guy named Dmitry uh, Kirilov, a senior lawyer of tax practice at the Brian Cave Lighten Paisner Law Firm in Russia about why the language of the amendments is problematic. Um, so yeah, he, he, I, it was kind of, the translation wasn't perfect, but there was a part about how he thinks that they're conflating 
digital currency with digital rights or something along those lines. Um, it was a bit confusing, but I guess there is some concern that the language of this bill is not great. And so it would not surprise me if there was something in there about how just using cryptocurrency is an aggravating circumstance, meaning that, you know, that can make your sentence longer, that can make the punishment harsher because there's this assumption that you're hiding income or something. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that really bothers me about this is this report or declare the wallet. You know, like, one, what does that mean? Like, turn over an XPUB? And, like, two, um, like, I, I mean, it's it's a translation, but uh, assuming at least this section is pretty accurate, um, like, does that mean if I have five wallets and I never let any of them um, have a million rubles throw, or flow through them? Like, it, am, I, am I clear then? Like, but if... Like, I, I'm just kind of really mostly worried about this pushing the precedent of, like, cough up an ex-pub to the government. Because that really starts to get into scary territory in terms of de-anonymizing the overall network. Yeah, and I'm not super familiar with the crypto legal situation in Russia, so I don't, it's, I don't know if there's already requirements to kind of declare that you have wallets um this bill it sounds like specifically is saying that they're making it a criminal offense if if one million or more rubles worth of virtual currency bitcoin or something else goes through the wallet and you haven't declared it that is a criminal offense and will be punished by forced labor fun yeah it's just like you know how I don't know, it's like how do you how do you deal with that? Like, what constitutes a wallet? Like, can I have multiple wallets? Does this apply to my wallets multiple in aggregate or a single one? Like, I'm I I really pretty sh I'm pretty sure they will want to keep it as vague as possible. Um, it's not like this country is particularly great when it comes to rule of law. <laughs> I just feel. Like, this goes in a weird direction. I mean, like, e even in the U.S., it's like, I have never seen an instance of, like, declare your wallet unless you are getting actively audited or something. Like, e even here, I, I have not seen the, like, any, like, serious substantial push or instance of that. And I can't think of any way you could materially enforce this other than, like, cough up an XPUB. Yeah, and for anyone who's thinking, wow, a million rubles, that's a lot, you know, must be a rich person. Um, Someone just pointed out in the chat that that's worth about 13 or 14 US dollars, or no, sorry, 13,000 uh, US dollars. So that's like, I mean, that's like poverty level money. Um, But that makes sense because, I, well, it makes sense in terms of like their authoritarian thinking because you know that's kind of you know around the level where you would have yeah so that that to me sounds like you know that's that's like if you have undeclared income you know there's there's a kind of a threshold by which the irs starts to care um it's much lower than that in the u.s but that sounds about right. So basically, just if you have undeclared income and it goes above this threshold, which is around 13,000, 14,000 US dollars worth of rubles, then yeah. Mm -hmm. Sensing a theme in today's episode. I want control. Financial surveillance. Yep. Ah, so do we want to get into yet another instance of that in the world? Let's do it. So, Venezuela um, has explicitly legalized cryptocurrency mining and established a regulatory framework for that. Now, this is where it gets fun. 
if you want to mine crypto, you need a license and you need to register um, on a government list. Um, you're going to have to hand over detailed information on the nature of your mining activities. Um, keep records on that for 10 years. Um, and there will be special licenses for uh, manufacturers of mining equipment or um, data centers to host them. Um, all import and manufacturing of mining equipment will be supervised by Venezuelan authorities. On top of that, all mining activity will be required um, to occur on the national digital mining pool. And mining in Venezuela with any other pool will get you penalties. Um, so yeah, um, pretty much Venezuela has just set up a regulatory framework to totally control the entire vertical stack of mining. Um, anything manufactured or imported into the country, the operation of everything, the details of any income or other data related to an operation, and the pool that the operation has to mine at. Um, so Venezuela has pretty much just completely nationalized um, Bitcoin mining in their country. Yay! It's a trap. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Did we? It's um, like... I can't actually remember because the last uh, the last time I remember talking about Venezuela, it was about that story about how you could supposedly um, you could supposedly pay for a passport in Bitcoin, and they were like, "Oh, BTC pay server instance thing looks like it's running." I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Did we ever update? Because what I found out later from uh i don't know if i actually said it during the show but what we found out later was that that was oh god no i actually can't remember i think it was only available for people outside of venezuela mm -hmm. yes i think that was the case yeah so um yeah the the, the fact that that happened and the, i just i don't know i feel like if you're in venezuela i don't You'd, I would just be extremely careful using cryptocurrency <laughs> and telling the government that you have it. Yeah. Like, I really feel bad saying this about, like, the umpteenth time on the umpteenth thing, but, like, once again, um, Venezuela is going to be a kind of canary in the coal mine um, for the rest of the world and how Bitcoin plays out in this type of environment. And, you know, personally, um, like the talk that I gave at the uh, Plebsec um, security conference, uh, you know, some things I've been writing and talking about lately, um, I think seeing how this plays out at a small scale is one of the most important things to pay attention to in the entire ecosystem right now because it, it really is like how do miners operate under this like are miners actually able to successfully operate in this country outside of this regulatory regime um like if they're not able to entirely like are they going to be able to obscure any layer of where this regulation interferes with things and like that's just such an important canary in the coal mine because if they can't here you know w why would miners be able to escape this in any other jurisdiction mm -hmm. so yeah i think uh you know, identifying this pool and the blocks they're mining and seeing how that plays out um, over the next couple of months uh, is something everybody should really be paying attention to. All right, I guess uh, next little mining update. Uh, nowhere near as dystopian, but uh, MicroBT, uh, the ASIC manufacturer founded by the former Bitmain engineer who designed the S9, um, 
is expanding their manufacturing capacity outside of China uh, to an unnamed um, Southeast Asian company, um, pretty much just for the manufacturing of equipment that's being shipped out to U.S. investors to get around the 25% uh, tariffs slapped on miners coming out of China. And um, yeah. So the Digital Currency Group um, is actually part of this deal, and a clause in the deal is pretty much um, they're going to be getting um, the first new batches um, produced in this facility. And they are planning actually on uh, pumping $100 million into a business to provide loans and financing to different mining operations. Um, so yeah, um, I think this is going to really change the dynamic in terms of micro BT and Bitmain because Bitmain has had a facility in Malaysia for exactly this purpose. Um, so that, you know, Western or American customers are not getting slapped with all the tariffs on Chinese exports. And, uh, you know, once micro BT is up and running in a similar situation, then that's going to kind of change the dynamic of American markets um, getting access to their equipment. So hopefully um, this is something that takes another bite out of Bitmain share of the pie and the DCG um, does not start putting their tendrils everywhere in North American mining operations. Whoopee! These are a lot of downer stories all in a row. Well, could be worse. They could be uh, uppers. <laughs> well, uh, I guess you want to give us local Bitcoin's final obituary? Well, uh, technically, uh, so uh, 6102 Bitcoin tweeted out an article from Coindesk that local Bitcoin's has um started using tools from the blockchain surveillance company elliptic but actually the uh if this is the bit obituary of local bitcoins it was written at the end of july um this is not um breaking news but i don't think that we discussed it so uh we will mention it now anyways because why not remind everyone that local bitcoins is dead um in a press release published by elliptic um Back in July, uh, they say that they announced a partnership with Local Bitcoins, the world's leading peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin exchange. Local Bitcoins now uses Elliptic's industry-leading suite of blockchain monitoring tools to prevent the illicit use of its platform and comply with regulations such as the EU's fifth money laundering directive, otherwise known as 5AMLD and know your customer regulations. By integrating with Elliptic Navigator to screen crypto transactions and Elliptic Lens to screen wallets, local Bitcoins um, have now automated their compliance and anti-fraud processes to drive cost savings and reduce risk. Um, and then there's a quote from Tom Robinson, by choosing Elliptic, local Bitcoins have demonstrated their commitment to eliminating illicit use of their platform. He's the co-founder and chief scientists of financial surveillance um like the rest of the crypto industry well no tom not like the rest of the crypto industry we're not all kyc up the ass um but anyway like the rest of the crypto industry peer-to-peer -peer, crypto exchanges have made huge strides in adapting to the new regulatory environment by introducing more uh, stringent technology enabled anti-money laundering controls. Our data shows this has led to a 50% reduction in the volume of crypto assets moving from dark markets to peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. Um, because apparently that is a thing to celebrate, I guess. Um, instead of cry that people are using peer-to-peer non-KYC up the ass exchanges less. Um, he also says we are pleased to, oh no, this is, this is from the KYC up the ass local Bitcoin CEO. Um, he says we are pleased to be partnering with the global leader in blockchain monitoring. Elliptic will enable us to achieve the highest levels of compliance while increasing operational efficiency and reducing costs. Um, okay. We will continue to invest heavily in AML and KYC to maintain a secure and trusted platform for our valued customers who we want to KYC up ass but yeah 
an obituary for local bitcoins although i i mean i think we kind of i mean i i have not uh, held them in high regard for quite a while so i'm neither surprised nor disappointed because i was already <laughs> i had already reached that level of hell yeah like the these types of cash platforms need to just go purely peer to peer like at, at this point um like that's really the only viable option like they just keep creeping further and further into like the same type of shit exchanges are when it's a centralized like meeting place or like bulletin board like the these things just need to go pure p2p or they're going to wind up in the same types of situations that companies like coinbase and kraken do free the p <sighs> well at least i think something positive next right we're going to get our source material for the blockbuster comedy movie of the year Oh, uh -oh. well, I don't, hmm, well, debatable, uh, because seriously, the UK justice system is pretty close to being a absurd, sad comedy sketch as well that I'm sure will be made at some point, maybe by me. But yes, um, breaking news as of last Monday, because um, yes, we has been a while but fake toshi has lost his motion for a summary judgment in federal court and will now be going to trial against the Kleiman estate um stefan steve steven can't remember what's with the ph that means an f why is it steven um steven pally tweeting about the 93 page decision that the judge wrote um says a little civil procedure lesson for context before we go further this is basically for people who don't know what a summary judgment is or lack of uh, summary judgment means and so he says um, it would probably be helpful in federal court litigation most states too in the united states one way that you can get out of a lawsuit or end a lawsuit is by filing something called a summary judgment motion if you can show that the material facts are not being disputed and that as a consequence you are entitled to judgment in your favor as a matter of law winner winner chicken dinner and you can get out of the case in full or in part Wright made uh, six arguments, all of which the judge ultimately says are losers. Next, the judge will get into the facts and identify ones that are not genuinely in dispute. There's no dispute, at least based on the evidence that Wright described himself as uh, and Kleiman as Satoshi on multiple occasions. These statements don't mean that when made, they were true, as in the judge is not saying that he is Satoshi. Um, they're basically just saying that it is undisputed that uh, Craig Wright has claimed to be Satoshi. And he says, let's see if the courts get there. Doubtful if they're actually able to make a solid determination that he's not Satoshi. Uh, but now I will read a part from the judgment that I think uh, summarizes the decision. One second. Do, 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 do. So, it says, I believe this is page 88. Uh, Upon review, the court concludes that this defense fails. Defendant has not raised any genuine issue of fact as to the actual delineated theories underlying this affirmative defense. Avoiding estate taxes and violation of privacy laws, as set forth in the amended answer, ECF number 87 at paragraph 34 through 35, Indeed, defendant's response to plaintiff's motion, uh, in, for anyone who hasn't been following the case, um, the defendant is Craig Wright and the plaintiff is the Kleiman estate. Um, so the plaintiff's motion focuses exclusively on alleged wrongdoing unrelated to tax evasion and privacy invasion and not pleaded as an affirmative defense. Defendant neither cites evidence nor raises arguments in support of his actual defense. Therefore, he fails to present a genuine dispute of material fact as to either element of the unclean hands defense under Callaway and summary judgment accordingly is warranted in plaintiff's favor. Wait a second. What? Anyway. Craig Wright did not win the summary judgment. Legalese is hard. <laughs> you can't handle the law. 
Oh man, this is uh, I don't know. I am definitely going to be following the highlights from the uh, the trial here because this is no more funny games. Um, it's actual trial now, where things can happen, and people can have to pay other people money they don't have, and go to jail for things. Go to jail for things that they never were. Seriously, though, like I just I cannot do a Craig Wright fucking impersonation. But like I just cannot get out of my head like Craig Wright standing at the witness stand like Jack Nicholson just like you can't handle the law. Yeah, I mean, what's perfect about this is that I don't I haven't looked um cuz I think actually his I think he lost his Medium account. I can't remember, but he, at one point or another he had a Medium account and he wrote many very hilarious blog posts and i believe in his bio he claimed to be a lawyer and um i don't know about other jurisdictions but in the uk where he seems to be quite often it is illegal as i've said a few times is legal to pretend to be a lawyer um so it's not only funny that he broke the law by pretending to be a lawyer when he is definitely not a lawyer while pretending to be satoshi nakamoto which he clearly is not um and is about to yeah go to trial as a not lawyer Woo! yes it i agree it would be hilarious to swap out craig wright for um assange because yes um yes it would be hilarious just I mean, the only reason it would be hilarious is because um, the absurdity of the Assange trial is that he is basically not allowed to speak except to his lawyers um, under the heavy scrutiny of the guards who sit next to him and the judge. And it would be hilarious to have Craig Wright go through a similar process where he has to listen for hours to people shit talking about him. Uh, without being able to say a word, which I don't think he'd be able to do. So he'd probably get thrown out on the first day for contempt of court or something. It's, I just hated all this preliminary shit because it's like there's no outcome yet. Like we like we don't know, but it's like it's a trial now. It's a trial. There's an outcome now. A thing at the end of it is going to happen and it's going to be fucking hilarious. And uh, unfortunately, like in Assange's case, the Australian government is probably going to do nothing to save him. Well, as in this case, um, they shouldn't. Alrighty, though. I guess, are we ready to read in between uh, the lines with Shinobi? Uh, an announcement relating to a massive Darknet market bust? Another one. Mm -hmm. So in May last year, um, I do think we covered this on the show, um, Wall Street Market, a, uh, a pretty decently sized dark net market uh, was busted. And apparently um, from that bust, a, uh, a lot of actionable information um, to continue investigating other entities was uh, obtained. <clears throat> and uh, this recent bust has occurred, nailing 170 people uh, worldwide, um, mostly with hard drugs. Um, so fentanyl, oxycodone, uh, hydrocodone, methamphetamine, heroin, coke, ecstasy, uh, and a, a decently small amount of guns. Um, but... I I have a question. Is is the reason that they're called hard drugs because, like hard forks, they're contentious? No, it's because you gotta pack them really dense when you when you sell them because they're worth a lot. So smash it in there. I see. <laughs> kind of like blocks. You could say. But um, yeah. So the, this operation, um, which was called Disruptor, um, nabbed a large amount of people all over the world. 
<clears throat> who had been vendors on uh, a number of different um you know platforms alpha bay dream wall street um and actually a, a few others that i've personally never heard of but um yeah i think in between the lines there is really a lot to take away in terms of um interagency coordination um ICE was involved, um, Homeland Security Investigations, um, the USPS um, Inspection Service. Um, and yeah, I see a pattern here that really tells me that they are probably doing a lot of fully comprehensive um, analysis from all ends. And I mean setting up fake vendors. Um, I mean like purchasing things just to send coins to a merchant and attempt to cluster and analyze after that. Um, probably things to nail down people's geography. I mean, at least internal to the US and with the cooperation of any other jurisdiction's postal service, um, you're gonna see where a package was dropped off what mailbox that came from what post office what area and you're going to be able to track that through the entire postal system like even with fake return addresses they'll know where it got dropped off roughly um that'll establish a basis for surveillance and i really think at this point like that is exactly what they're doing. That type of all encompassing comprehensive surveillance. Um, because honestly, if they weren't, I don't think they'd be able to actually keep making busts of this size. I mean, at this point, um, <clears throat> you know, the, these marketplaces, these people aren't full fucking retards. Like they have to have figured some of these things out, thought about these types of threats. And so, like, I really can't see anything else going on. Like, I really, they're probably tracing everything, like money flows, package source uh, area, like how that flows through, looking for other things <clears throat> that fit profiles through the uh, postal system, you know, making trajectories from the same rough area to places. Like, how many customers data or <clears throat> addresses you know have been gained in in busts that users aren't going to get busted they don't give a shit that somebody bought an eight ball of coke but now they know that that guy buys stuff and so when a package shows up at their door backtrace it i like i really think like <clears throat> this is what's going on and at this point I've, I've said this for years, like dark net markets like this are retarded, like using this type of coordination as anything but bulk backbones, you're going to get busted dumbass. Like, cause all of these potential threads are thrown out there and they will get picked up and fucking followed. And every bust gives you more threads to follow. So like, you know, honestly, I, I don't give a shit. <clears throat> who out there thinks uh, keep using the dark net market because if you don't, Bitcoin isn't Bitcoin. Like if you use these things, you're an idiot. You're an absolute fucking idiot because this is the type of web of shit going on that you are putting yourself in the middle of. You mean like a dark web? Yes, exactly. But it's like, you know what I mean though, Janine? Like I'm serious. I think a lot of the the users buying things off these places like they have not for half a second actually thought through all the different ways that you could nail operations like that like it it's it's fucking stupid like go find drugs in the real world like a normal person if you want to do drugs it's a lot safer and it's a lot less likely to get you caught up in massive international intelligence dragnets. I believe this is the moment to play that uh, David Bowie song. Which one? There's so many good ones. Afraid of Americans. 
but I like American music. Alrighty though, uh, wanna go out on a, on a positive story? Yes. So, Unchained Capital um, has released a new service um, for businesses, um, advanced business accounts. And pretty much the, the entire logic here is just software facilitation for um, wallet management. And at any time, um, like Unchained is not involved in any of the keys of these multi-sigs. <clears throat> um, a business could just take Caravan, um, their open source tool, their keys, and have full control of their funds at any time. But um, the main kind of value add here is just granularity and composability and making that very simple. Um, and it's pretty much a very streamlined um, interface where an owner can set up a business account and then add key holders that can sign. And very simply, um, you know, remove, add, um, change the, the composition of this account and then reflect that moving coins on chain and also um, just read only access um, for auditors or financial people involved in a company. And it's pretty much a very, you know, simple thing that could be used for just businesses pushing things onto their balance sheet um, and just handling that very simply in terms of self custody in a context where, these coins don't belong to any single person. They're part of a business entity. And so it's also um, kind of generalized so that any other type of uh, service company or other collaborative custody company can kind of build out their service on top of this as well. And, you know, they're pretty much... Um, setting themselves up here i think for some really crazy shit once we get taproot because at this point it's pretty much setting up individual accounts um you know segregating things in different accounts potentially with different participants but once you start adding taproot into the picture um things can get really fucking crazy. Um, like rather than just a single multi-sig wallet with the single script that you have to lock a UTXO to to change anything, <clears throat> like Taproot opens the door for so much more complexity. Like having a single account at face balanced by a normal controlling group <clears throat> and then a fallback um, between different subsets of that group um with maybe i don't know a lawyer or something um coming into the picture with a new key to replace somebody for different situations where that was necessary or you you could even do you know really crazy things like lock up uh, at the very bottom something i don't know let's just say that the a company headquarters gets fucking nuked and everybody dies who is holding the keys um Eventually, shareholders could just unlock the money and distribute that with pre-signed transactions or something. Like, well, once Taproot really enters the picture, like the types of flexibility and different situations and recourses that a business might need or want to take that you could think of can all just be rolled into a single account. And so, like, really, th this is, I think a lot more in the long term than just helping, you know, small businesses or companies um, self custody their Bitcoin securely like this really could as a platform built out with things like Taproot really offer whole new ways to just manage a, a business. And I think that could get really fucking interesting. You know, like, imagine that, Janine, like, there's some disagreement in a company about what to do that isn't getting resolved, and everything is locked up in a multi-sig, 
baking in a path where, hey, if, if nobody gets their shit together, then shareholders just take all the money back. Like, pay out who who is owed stuff in terms of liabilities, but that's just a that just happens if management in a business, you know, remains at an impasse on something. Mm-hmm. I mean, personally, I think this would be a very, you know, built out and extended with things like Taproot. Like, imagine cooperatively owned companies operating with things like this. I think uh, if they play this right, like Unchained Capital is sitting on a fucking gold mine with this one. If they really think forward and build that out. All right. Shinobi Autism done. Final thoughts. Well, speaking of autism, um, the oh, yeah. last the last week of the Assad trial has been extremely frustrating. I mean, it's extremely frustrating in general, but this section was disgusting for a number of reasons. First of all, it involved the disclosure and testimony of his doctors and other people who have examined him in some kind of psychological or medical context and as of this point they have not released the full reports um from the testimony that those doctors provided that may become the case it's being debated still but there was enough detail in what they said in court that um any media who have access to the trial anyone in the court it was able to report on it and so you got basically tons of intimate details about you know his mental health and medical history for like the last 20 years especially um so yeah legal processes are terrible when it comes to medical privacy and i can't imagine what it feels like to have your medical history not only disclosed to the public but then to be serrated by prosecutors who have absolutely no empathy whatsoever um one of the arguments um because one of the testimonies or actually a lot of the doctors testified to this was um, about whether he had autism slash Asperger's traits and behaviors and how that affected, you know, his ability to cope with stress and to resist various pressures that may result in his harm if he is extradited. And basically the prosecution made a bunch of arguments about how he can't possibly be autistic or have autistic traits because of XYZ. And some of those XYZ things were the fact that he got custody of his child when he was around the age of 20 um, because no sane court would apparently give a, give custody of a child to an autist. Um, also, the fact that he is a public speaker and has written books is also apparently something that an autist can't do, according to the prosecution. A number of things that are like just, if it, it even if it had nothing to do with him, are just plain wrong and show a deep misunderstanding about these mental health conditions and should be used as proof that, you know, if this is the best argument that the U.S. government can come up with to dissuade the U.K. court from uh, potentially not sending him to the U.S. on the basis that he would be a suicide risk and they have a history of refusing to send people on that basis, most recently Lori Love, um, the U.S. prosecution is basically proving, th- they're basically arguing against their own position because if that is what the U.S. government actually believes and it reflects the prison system's understanding of these conditions, they will not be able to provide any kind of adequate t- treatment, which they have been claiming they can. Um, the other interesting thing, uh, there was like a, ma- it was like a, it seemed rather insignificant at the time that it was given, but 
um, it actually is quite significant, which is that there was a technical expert who testified on Friday. And he was actually one of the people who went through the forensic evidence for Chelsea Manning's court martial. Uh, so he has knowledge of, for example, uh, chat logs between accounts that have been associated to Assange, but do not actually use Assange's name. For example, there is a Jabber account that um, is of interest uh, that had the name Nathaniel Frank. And Nathaniel Frank is involved in a chat log with Chelsea Manning with regard to the allegation that Assange supposedly encouraged Chelsea Manning um, or may have aided Chelsea Manning in breaking a password hash. Um, and we're, you know, the technical details of that were went through, but the most interesting part of the debate about that was, uh, does the government actually have evidence that this Nathaniel Frank is Assange? And you'd think that after, you know, the court martial ended in 2013, you'd think after seven years, the government would have an answer to that question and, or at least be able to give some kind of indication that they can prove that. Um, and basically, uh, this this expert who was involved in the court martial was asked, "Do you have evidence about whether Nathaniel Frank is actually properly attributed to Assange?" And his answer was, "No, it has been assumed." So literally, the crux of a major allegation in the indictment about Assange encouraging Chelsea Manning to break a password hash or to help her break a password hash and to thereby engage in computer hacking, scary word, um, is, oh, something wrong with the mic. Okay. So yeah, as, as I was saying, yeah. So the crux of one of the major allegations, which brings in the computer fraud and abuse act is whether Assange attempted to break this password hash and it, the, you know, lots of arguments about whether that having that password would have done anything, um, which there is many credible arguments that it wouldn't have anyway. But um, yeah, there doesn't seem to be any evidence from the government side. They did not, during cross-examination, apparently make any attempt to say that, yes, the government does have evidence. So imagine that a major part of the indictment is based on assumptions that have not been <laughs> that have not been fixed over seven years. So that was quite interesting. Yeah, the whole arguments around the autism shit were insane. I thought it was uh, really ridiculous that because he could speak fluently about a very familiar subject in a highly controlled environment, that there's no way he could be on the spectrum. Yeah, it's almost like they've never met or seen anyone with autism ever, because that is actually exactly a description of what an autistic person or certain um certain categories um of people who are on the spectrum can do like they're i mean this this whole thing this whole argument and discussion kind of relied on what i think is an outdated concept or framework for autism which is that there is a a spectrum there's a line which is you're either autistic you're like a little autistic or you're very autistic and i think I, there's been a number of posts that I've seen over the years that really try to frame that better, which is that it's not a spectrum. It's kind of a wheel of spectrums. You can experience symptoms differently and that can affect how you are perceived and the degree to which people think you have autism or exhibit those symptoms strongly or not. For example, there are people with autism who have no problem or very little problem making eye contact um, or as it's called non nonverbal communication, but they exhibit other symptoms that uh, collected together do show that they have autism, but that doesn't mean that they have all the same symptoms. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that all of them have the same severity. It's, it's not this, you know, 
because basically the prosecution was trying to get the doctors to say, you know, he's only a little autistic. And it's like, what, what does that even mean? Um, it doesn't make sense. Like, <laughs> so it's just a bunch of like really bad misconceptions. And it, sh I, well, the one interesting thing that I hope gets brought up in court, I don't know if it will, but um, this whole debate, about, uh, especially in the UK, about whether this is considered a political prosecution or not is, I mean, it should be kind of shut down by the fact that um, people have written literally letters to the Queen about this. And guess what? She responded to at least one of those letters and said that she would not be intervening in the Assange case because she does not intervene in political matters. Um, how is that not a giant red stamp that this is a political prosecution if the queen literally says she cannot be involved? Um, I hope that gets brought up in court. I don't know if it would have relevance, but I feel like given that the UK is still this kind of constitutional monarchy, maybe they will have some respect for their queen uh, saying that. I don't know, but yeah. Yeah. And it was also, uh, it was quite funny um, with the technical expert on Friday because um, I could tell from the arguments that the prosecutor, the main prosecutor, James Lewis, uh, by the way, James Lewis has a hilarious website. Um, you know how, it, it, I mean, it's a common thing for people to have like, you know, praise from past coworkers or bosses or whatever on their website because it's like their resume. But he has a website that says uh, a quote, um, a charming man with a mega brain, <laughs> literally mega brain. And so it was quite funny during, uh, I think it was Kevin Gastola, he tweeted about how the main prosecutor was making these very clear attempts to sound like he had technical understanding of the subject matter because they were talking about like hashes and encryption can you the the can you break it if you're a mega expert hacker or something and it seemed really obvious that either the u.s government super prepared a script for him on this so that he wouldn't sound like an idiot or he took a like introduction to computer science vocabulary before coming into this case um because uh as kevin gustola says we got uh, a thumbnail history of land manager um so yes quite quite bizarre yeah well uh i'm kind of out of thoughts I'm trying not to be my usual dickish self. Um, Meanwhile, I have Zcash and Monero people arguing in my mentions. So popcorn for after the show. Alrighty, though. I guess uh, that's a wrap for the day. And uh, catch you later, punks. Bye. <laughs> Was there was there that sang it just on the red? Yeah, you have foot three head. Is he in it? Yes, he is. 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 Yes, he is.